everyone. Thank you for joining today in this session. I am Gokul Hulani, convener of Mood Code Association. And I would like to welcome you all on behalf of MCA and NLI Gopal. This session is in collaboration with the Indian Arbitration Law Review. The topic for today is the relationship between insolvency and arbitration proceedings, a common law perspective. Today, we have with us a very distinguished speaker who needs no introduction. He has been installed in the field of arbitration, Nakul Devan, sir. However, for the sake of propriety, a brief introduction about Nakul, sir. He is a graduate of CLC Delhi, both an LLM from N NUS and NYU. He has decided, designated as a senior counsel in 2019 by the Supreme Court of India. He further practices in Singapore, London, and New Delhi. He has also been associated with the prestigious 20 SX Street chain. Further, he is also an Archang Associate Professor at the National University of Singapore. Now, the Managing Editor of IELR, Arpita Pandey, shall brief about her initiative, post which we shall begin with the session. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Arpita Pandey, the Managing Editor at Indian Arbitration Law Review. On behalf of the entire team IALR, I extend a very warm welcome to Mr. Nakul Divan and all the participants of today's session. The Indian Arbitration Law Review is a peer-reviewed journal published annually by the National Law Institute University, Bhopal, with the support of LNL partners. We work under the able guidance of Mr. Prashant Mishra, who is a partner at LNL and has expertise in arbitration law. The Indian Arbitration Law Review was founded in the year 2018, and since then we have brought about two of our volumes successfully in February 2019 and February 2020, respectively. Volume 3 of the journal is due for February 2020-21. We would like to thank Mr. Nakul Divan for taking out time to address this August gathering of arbitration enthusiasts on such a pertinent topic. Now, without any further ado, we shall begin with the session. However, before doing that, just a general caution for all the participants, please switch off their microphones during the session. Also, we shall be trying to take pick up the questions at the end of the session. So if anyone has any questions, can we please write that in the chat box and we'll try, try to take them. I would now like, like to thank Nakul sir for joining today and would hand over the screen to him. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Gokul. Thank you, Arpita. And thank you to all to the organizers and everybody who's sitting and listening to this. I mean, it is a Friday evening, and I really wonder why none of you have anything better to do than listen to a legal talk. I mean, if I was at your age, I definitely wouldn't have done it. And this is just a hint that as soon as this gets over, you should be ready to log off. Don't put in any more questions. You've got a great Friday evening ahead, wherever you guys are. Uh, and even if you're in lockdown mode uh, and you can't go out to have a great time on a Friday evening, you certainly can do better than uh, posing questions at the end of this uh, talk. Uh, I, I must tell you that when I was invited for this uh, lecture, I was given a slightly more complicated and a slightly more tougher topic. And I, and I said, listen, that, that's just too complicated. It's too politically sensitive. And I don't think I want to speak on it. At which point... I got another topic, which was uh, the topic that you have today. It's about the relationship between insolvency and arbitration. Oh, and then it says it deals with a common law perspective. I didn't realize how much hard work it would be for me to get up to speed with it to try and make this slightly interesting because insolvency by itself can potentially be very boring. And arbitration, while it's great fun in practice, can in theory be very boring. So effectively, what you have is boring plus boring, which is a double negative, which is exactly what insolvency and arbitration does to you. Because when you're looking at a dispute and you're looking at it from a corporate perspective, you're looking at negativity because no corporate ever wants to enter into a dispute. And when you're looking at insolvency, oh my God, it is a mess. Because if you're looking at insolvency and arbitration, it's nothing else but a double negative. No corporate entity which enters into a contract wants to AC an arbitration because nobody likes arbitration or any form of dispute resolution because it obviously means that something has gone wrong 
And when you look at it and you club it with insolvency, then it's even worse. So it's effectively like going down the drain. I mean, from a corporate perspective, nothing can be worse. So given this grim start to this lecture, let me see how I can enliven a Friday evening for you guys. Okay, so I'm going to first give you a one minute uh, statutory lecture. You know, when you're looking at insolvency and winding up, you're looking at a concept which by itself is not arbitrable. Okay, it's not even something that can be adjudicated by a civil court. And that is because there are statutes in place, and it's not just in India, it's, it's all over the world. We've got statutes in place which deal with issues related to insolvency. And it is a specialized regime that is followed. But when you move away from this boring statute and you put this in practice, you will then really come up with matters which are extremely interesting. So I'm going to divide this talk into three spheres. The first sphere is going to be a war story, a war story which I was involved with, which I found reasonably exciting, which probably left a little jaw open uh, when it happened. And this is a jaw open in the best possible way in, 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 in a legal proceeding. The second I want to talk about broad tensions that arbitration and insolvency and the regime has. And the third I want to talk about what is commonly known as winding up proceedings and the correlation it has with arbitration or any form of dispute resolution. So let's begin with a war story. Let's begin with the war story. The war story starts six years ago. Okay, let me rephrase that. The war story ended six years ago. It started eight years ago. And it all related to India's favorite game. Okay, the game of cricket. And guess what? It didn't relate, and it related to something even more exciting. It related to media rights about cricket. And what was really bubbling eight years ago was the IPL. That's around the time it had just started off. Uh, everybody was excited about the IPL. And apart from viewers in India, viewers in the Middle East, viewers in the traditional jurisdiction where cricket is played, guess what? North America and Canada had a lot of viewers for the IPL because there's a massive uh, Indian population there, there's a massive Asian population there, and all of them, all of them wanted to watch the IPL. So the IPL rights were sold, and lo and behold, a couple of years after the rights were sold, arose a dispute in relation to the amount of money that had to be paid. Now, all of this looks very glitzy and glamorous, but let me tell you, when you go back and you look at disputes that arise, you realize that the world of the IPL, the world of rights, the world of contract law is not glitzy and it's not glamorous. It's all about the brass tack disputes. It's all about, it's, it's effectively a corporate war. So, commenced an arbitration. One of the largest media, the, the, I mean, the, the party which had the rights to the IPL had licensed them to an entity in North America. There was a dispute as far as the payments were concerned. An arbitration was commenced. The arbitration started in Singapore. We went through the entire realm of the arbitration and we then started the hearing. And naturally, at any arbitration hearing, what you have are the clients and what you have are the witnesses. Now, as far as the other company was concerned, the company was a large company and it had three different witnesses. Uh, they had a marketing manager, they had, uh, they had somebody else from the legal department, and they had one more person explaining rights and media rights and all very fancy stuff. And from our side, we had the two promoters of this company in the United States of America, who were not just the clients, but also the witnesses. And the hearing, as I remember correctly, started on the 30th of June, 2014. So when our client came to give evidence, what the other side did is to put pressure on the client, file another lawsuit in Singapore, and decided that instead of serving the client in the United States, which would not be easy because you'd be required to follow the Hague Convention route, you would serve the client personally, who had to be at Maxwell Chambers giving evidence, and lo and behold, a bailiff came from court and said, sir, I have instructions to serve you. And he was served with another lawsuit and he said, oh my God, I'm, I'm staring at another couple of million dollars. This is absolutely unfair. This is absolutely wrong. And by the end of that hearing, he was absolutely livid with what happened. I mean, we as lawyers just had to tell him that that's really where it was. We all went back. Five in the morning, I get a call. So I was like, why are you waking me up at five in the morning? This is day two. We're now on the 1st of July. And they said, oh, we wanted to let you know that our company's gone bankrupt. 
And I was like, how did that happen overnight? I mean, this is just so strange. What the client did is the client got in touch with an attorney in the United States and said, I'm going to declare Chapter 7 voluntary bankruptcy. And once I declare Chapter 7 voluntary bankruptcy, then according to California law, no proceeding, let it be an, let it be an arbitration proceeding, can carry on against me. I said, this is really exciting. So we, I got into work at about 8. Client was there. The solicitor was there. We got into a conference call with the American lawyer. He sent me all the relevant stuff. And he said, well, just go tell the arbitrator, bad luck. You can't do anything. We're a company that's bankrupt. Arbitration can't proceed. And now I will see how they can even get their claim. And that's what we did. We walked in at half past 10, went into the hearing and said, and I remember this, I was just looking at the transcript of this earlier this morning because I have that transcript and I said, uh, Mr. Arbitrator, I've been instructed to inform you that uh, the company's gone into bankruptcy and under California law, so-and-so, so-and-so, the arbitration can't proceed. And literally, it was a jaw-dropping moment because here was this large company which thought it had done the smartest thing by putting pressure on this guy, by serving the guy with a Singapore court proceeding. And it suddenly realized that it was now in an arbitration proceeding with a company that had initiated the insolvency and bankruptcy regime in the United States of America, under which regime it could not proceed. So, well, hell, literally hell broke loose. Uh, the other side's lawyer, very senior counsel said, can you give me some time, let me go and take some instructions. Instructions were taken. And then he came back at half past 12 in the afternoon and said, well, I have an escape route for you, Mr. Arbitrator. And the arbitrator finally said, okay, now, now this looks logical. Let me, let me see if there's an escape route out of this. And he cited a decision. It was an English decision uh, called, uh, in, in a case called Skyscar versus Vivendi, where what had happened was that a Polish company had been declared bankrupt in Poland. And they initiated an arbitration in England. And the English court took the view that in an international commercial arbitration, if the arbitration proceeding had been initiated prior to the insolvency, the governing law of the arbitration agreement would kick in and govern the dispute, and it would no longer be governed by the local Polish uh, insolvency law. And on that basis, took the view that the arbitration could proceed. And he said, I'm citing this decision before you to tell you that the bankruptcy here has been declared after the arbitration has been commenced. And you should not hold your hands in proceeding with this matter. And then he also cited the Court of Appeal judgment uh, of the Singapore Court of Appeal in something called the Luga Chartering, where the Court of Appeal in a slightly different context had taken the view that a Singapore court was not necessarily bound by a foreign arbitration, uh, by, 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 by a foreign uh, statute under which insolvency had been declared. Because it took the view that foreign statutes would not have extraterritorial application. And citing both the decisions, told the arbitrator that you can actually go and proceed with this arbitration. The declaration of bankruptcy should not stop these proceedings. But the arbitrator asked me a question. He said, what do you have to say, Mr. Devan? And I said, sorry, I have no instructions to say anything more than what I've told you in the morning. My instructions are to tell you that you cannot proceed. And I just want to put on record that I disagree with the submission that my learned friend and has raised. And I said, I'm very sorry, but I really can't even carry on sitting in this hearing because I have no instructions to sit in this hearing. And we pretty much got up and we, 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 we bowed down and we left. But what happened after that? The arbitrator apparently took the view that he could proceed with the hearing, proceeded with the hearing, ex parte now, without any lawyers, without any respondent, and passed an award in favor of the claimant. Has that award been enforced? I actually don't know. I don't know. But it had to be enforced in California because that's where the assets were lying. And as far as California law is concerned, well, those proceedings could not have gone on. Now, why, does, why did I bring this story up? Because let me tell you, the story has more than just one color. The decision, which had been relied upon by the counterparty, which is an English decision, had an interesting twist. It's a decision in Swaiska versus Vivendi. And the interesting twist is that in Swaiska versus Vivendi, the Swiss courts on the identical case had taken the view 
that in view of the declaration of bankruptcy or the initiation of bankruptcy in Poland, they could not proceed with the Swiss arbitration. Now, what are you looking at? What you are effectively looking at tension between two major arbitral centers, London and Switzerland, where on a similar set of facts, the court has taken or the arbitral tribunal has taken a different view based on the extent to which foreign uh, uh, insolvency and foreign insolvency regimes have an impact on arbitration proceedings. England has taken the view that it can proceed. Switzerland has taken the view that it cannot proceed. In Vivendi, what the Polish court did when the, mat, when, when, the, when the award went for enforcement was that they accepted the English view and they said that we will enforce this award. But that's a very fact-specific issue. Whether that would have happened in Singapore is a matter of debate because nobody ever carried that forward. But all of this goes to tell you that there is a tension. And before I come to why you have the tension, if you look at the facts of the case that I was running, and you look at the facts and say, well, surely in your case, you really had a mischievous respondent because the respondent wasn't happy with something and voluntarily declared bankruptcy overnight. Let's put ourselves in the present situation that we are in today. We are in the COVID-19 situation. I mean, businesses are going left, right and center. They're going down left, right and center today because they just can't do anything. It's just not possible for them to survive. What happens in that scenario? Don't you put yourself in a scenario where you've got to understand the tensions between the two laws to be able to understand whether you should proceed or not proceed? Does it matter that the arbitration began in December or January of 20, I mean, December of 2019 or January of 2020? Because the declaration of insolvency may have happened now only because of COVID-19. So could you, could, you look at, could you look at the conduct of the parties as a basis to decide whether or not the, the arbitral regime has to overcome or, or be superior to the insolvency regime, especially from an international scenario, that's a very debatable point. And, and the tension that I, that I now come to, which is the second part of my lecture, arises from here. When you're looking at the contractual regime, you're looking at effectively a private contract, a private regime. So when two parties enter into a contract, they're entering into a contract in the private sphere. It doesn't matter whether they've chosen arbitration or civil court jurisdiction or an international commercial court as a method for resolving disputes. It is still the resolution of a private dispute. So even if a state court resolves that dispute, it's still resolving a private dispute. It's not interested in the public. And that private dispute is resolved in relation to loan agreements, that's lender, I mean borrowers and lenders. It's resolved in private contracts and where, where performance has to be done, but it's all very private. But where it gets a little testy is this. The insolvency regime involves more than just private interests. It involves public interests. So I might enter into, I, I, a company might enter into a contract with a particular bank. That's a private contract. The bank has lent me, say, hypothetically, 100 crore rupees. Today, when you look at India, you look at corporate India, you're looking at debts which are worth 10,000 crores, 20,000 crores. I mean, there are some companies which have a debt of 100,000 crores. All of that money is public money because it's the depositor's money which is now being given in the form of a loan. And if there is an NPA, because a company is not doing well, then what should overcome the other? What should override the other? So not overcome, override the other. Should it be the public law regime, which is set out under the insolvency code, or the private regime, which has been provided for under arbitration? And the tension that arises there is what resulted in what was an extremely interesting decision of the Singapore Court of Appeal. And that's a decision in a case called Larson versus Petropod, where the Singapore Court was concerned with these very interests. And the Singapore Court decided that it wanted to have a three-pronged approach to the problem. And the approach it essentially had, I don't want to go into this in great detail, was the following. They said that if the dispute in any way involves 
matters which are going to touch upon other creditors, which means we're going into the public sphere, then frankly, those will not be arbitrary. But if it is going to be purely private, then yes, in relation to those disputes, arbitration could be done. And I think that's an extremely logical approach, and that's, that's probably the correct approach. Because there is a tension, and you cannot let private sphere or, the, or, the, or private dispute resolution take over in a manner that it supersedes a public interest in terms of the public resolution that has to be gone into when you are a company that is looking at some form of statutory uh, either relief or statutory reconstruction under a public law regime. And the reason is important. A company may owe one creditor 100 crores, but let's assume that you have creditors who have the same financial standing, sorry, who have the same financial security, they have the same claim. Why should a company favor one where they have a 100 crore claim as opposed to other creditors who might also want a little bit of the pie. And that is why you have to let all creditors who are on the same footing have the same rights when a company goes into financial difficulty. And the reasoning that the Court of Appeal gave in Larson versus Petropod was very simple. It was effectively twofold. One, they said insolvency is for the benefit of creditors. And two, they said, you cannot in these circumstances distinguish between a creditor's interest, even if they are part of the same class. But they didn't completely bar certain disputes from being arbitrable. This now really takes me into the last section of what I want to discuss with you, and that, will, that relates to winding up proceedings. If you look at the Indian regime, this is a matter that has gone on for a significant number of years. This was whether it was in the IBC court or in the pre-IBC regime. And the law that was set out was the following. If there was an undisputed debt, then a party could ask for the winding up of a company if within a particular statutorily prescribed period that debt was not free. Now, in the Indian scenario, given that civil trials would take a significantly long time, a lot of parties started resorting to that mechanism to be able to pressurize a company for paying its debt. So you let, so it resulted in a series of judgments where, while the court set out certain thresholds, it also took the view that the insolvency proceeding was not a debt collecting mechanism and could not supersede. A, disp a dispute resolution mechanism which had been provided for uh, either by state courts or by the parties under the contract and that would naturally include arbitration. What happened when the IBC came in was that the general principle of initiating winding up proceedings if there was an undisputed debt was retained and all of this led to a decision called Mobilox which was decided a couple of years ago by the Indian Supreme Court. But before I come to Mobilox, I'm going to take a minute and I'm just going to digress. This, and, the, the, and my digression is that this is not just an Indian specific thing. This is an accepted principle in the common law world. So in Singapore, as well as in England, you have a similar test. You also have a similar position in Malaysia, in Hong Kong, and in Australia except that it comes with a little bit of tweaks in relation to the threshold that you have to be able to get through to be able to invoke the insolvency regime. And the threshold that is there, which is broadly around the same, but like I said, with a, little, with a few tweaks, is the following. To show that there is an undisputed debt, you have to, if you're in Singapore, set up a prima facie case and show that this is, and, and to, to, to be able, sorry, let, let, me, let me rephrase that. To, for a party to show that there is a disputed debt, a party has to show that there is a prima facie case and that its defense is bona fide. In England, you've got a test called the triable issue test. So you've got parties which 
a party has to show that there is a triable issue and therefore there's no reason to say that the, that, the, that the debt is undisputed. Now again, there's a, there are a couple of tweaks even under English law, but I don't want to go into details of that. And in India, you've got a test, you've got the test set out in mobile arts. And the mobile arts test is what we call the plausible theory test. That the counterparty, which is the party which against whom you want to file insolvency proceedings, has to show that there is a plausible dispute that it that, that, that exists. And in that plausible dispute test, there is another interesting point which the Supreme Court has set out. And what it is set out is that this dispute must be raised prior to the time when the notice for initiating the insolvency proceedings has been filed. So it's not just a substantive test that the Indian Supreme Court lays out, but it's also a procedural test in terms of timing. And all of this becomes extremely critical when you're looking at the toss between arbitration and the insolvency regime. Because if a party is able to show that yes, there exists a plausible dispute, or there's a prima facie case that there is a dispute, or there's a triable issue which arises, then the insolvency regime will not kick in and the matter will potentially go in for arbitration. Now, in all of this, let me give you a little spin to the story, which is how I will close this. And the spin to the story is now a case which has been filed before the Indian Supreme Court and is coming up for hearing sometime in the first or the second week of August. And the spin to the story is the following. Under the Indian uh, insolvency, the, 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 the insolvency and bankruptcy court, there is a distinction between who is an operational creditor and who is a financial creditor. So for the benefit of those students who are listening to this, I'll just, I'll just articulate the difference. An operational creditor is a person with whom you entered into a contract and you owe the person some money. A financial creditor is typically a bank who has lent you some money for the purposes of funding your company or funding your projects, is probably is working capital uh, and stuff like that. Now, the mobile loss regime, when it talks about a disputed debt, does it in the context of an operational creditor. So somebody supplied you goods, you haven't paid for it, you've admitted that you need to pay them for it. Well, frankly, that can't, cannot be a disputed debt. As far as the financial creditor is concerned, there's very little reason for a debt to be disputed. I mean, today if a bank has lent you 100 crores, well, frankly, they've lent you 100 crores. And if you fail to make that payment or make the payment of interest in relation to the 100 crores, the bank can foreclose it and the bank can take you um, effectively to the cleaners, but the bank can actually initiate proceedings against you under the IBC. And that's a separate section. Now, the question is, can you refer a matter in relation to a financial creditor to arbitration? And that question is going to come up live uh, for being considered by the Indian Supreme Court in the first week of August. So for whoever is interested in all of this, watch the space. Let's see what happens. It is our argument, and it will be the argument that I will make on behalf of one of the parties that, that, that you cannot invoke arbitration when it relates to a matter uh, or a financial creditor when insolvency proceedings have already been commenced. But I don't have the last word on this. I just have an argument to make. Supreme Court will have the last word. So like I said, watch the space. But on that note, I'd like to thank you all for taking out your time on a Friday evening to listen to this. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for such an enlightening and knowledgeable session for us. So I think so. And now open up the floor for the questions. Does anyone have any questions to Nakul, sir? I'm hoping they've all taken cue from what I told them. <laughs> I think and they're I very clear about it. And I have a great Friday evening. So before you start threatening me with questions, <laughs> all right, so I'll right. answer any questions if there are, but, uh, <laughs> but don't be compelled to ask me questions. Uh, right, sir. Good evening, sir. This is Ronak Doshi. I am a second year student. 
uh, I have one question with respect to what you told about the Mobilox case. So uh, basically, you mentioned that in the Mobilox case, the Supreme Court iterated that uh, the insol uh, any suit or arbitration can not be considered uh, once once the insolvency. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Uh, came to the question or regarding, and you said that it's about the Supreme Court. Ronik, can you reiterate your question? We're not audible right now. Am I audible now? You're slightly better. Okay, yeah. Hello, am I audible? Yes, Ronik, you are audible now. So, so my question is with respect to the Mobilox case in which you mentioned that Supreme Court has iterated that no arbitration proceeding or a civil suit cannot be uh, can be filed after uh, uh, once the insolvency proceedings has started. However, with respect to that particular uh, thing, uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, has uh, iterated one of the cases. I exactly do not know the case law, but not the Supreme Court. The uh, glad iterated in one of the cases that. Uh, once the civil suit has started, even after the insolvency proceeding, then uh, it uh, then the insolvency proceedings will have to stop, and the civil suit because uh, it's a civil matter, so it should continue in the civil court. After which, the Mobilox judgment came and it iterated that once the insolvency proceedings has started, a civil suit or arbitration proceeding cannot start. Sorry, I couldn't understand your question because I think there was there were a couple of gaps, but. Let me just tell you what I said about Mobilox. Mobilox doesn't say that just because an insolvency proceeding has started, you cannot commence an arbitration. You see, under the IBC, there are two stages. When you're looking at when you're, when you're looking at section seven and eight and nine, these are these are the effective sections that you're looking at. From the perspective of an operational creditor, you're looking at eight and nine. Nine relates to the admission of an insolvency proceeding. Now, the way it works is this. If I send a notice under Section 8 saying that there's an undisputed debt, and in response to that notice, for the first time, the counterparty takes the view that no, the debt is disputed, never having disputed it prior to my notice, then Mobilox says, but that doesn't appear to be a plausible defense. Effectively, it goes back to the old doctrine that it's probably a moonshine defense. You're raising it now because you've been threatened with a notice under the IBC. But if there is some documentary evidence of, the pre of a pre-existing dispute, then notwithstanding the fact that I may have filed a notice under Section 8 of the IBC, the counterparty can initiate arbitration, and one of the grounds they can take for non-admission of a petition is that there always was a pre-existing dispute. This is not an undisputed debt. You cannot initiate the IBC and you cannot go ahead and admit the petition and then let the moratorium kick in. That's really the distinction uh, that Mobilox draws. Uh, so we have one more question. There have been a series of judgments of NCLAT which reinforce the idea that IBC proceedings cannot be used as a recovery mechanism. In case there is a final arbitration award which has survived the challenge under Article 34 and would then obviously be an admitted debt, can IBC proceedings then be initiated? How do you think that, that this position can be balanced by the IBC court? So, if you look at the decision of the Supreme Court in K. Kishin, K. Kishin takes the view that a dispute continues, not just, just, just because you have an arbitral award in your favor doesn't mean that you have an undisputed debt. The dispute continues until the stage of a section 34 as well as the section of a stage of a section 37. And perhaps to, if you use that logic, even if, a Supreme, if, if an SLP is admitted. Now, if you've gone through the entire mechanism and the counterparty is lost at every stage, then the arbitral award, yes, would arguably be an undisputed debt. And if it's an undisputed debt, because frankly, there is no other legal recourse, then it is very arguable that instead of filing enforcement proceedings under Section 36, you could consider approaching uh, the NCAT. But yes, 
I'm saying the NCLT, yeah, and, 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 uh, and the IPC, but that's really what it would be. So on this, I need to have one question. Uh, so what is the uh, advice, the, the most profound advice that you got as in your student years that you think that it will be necessary for us? Something that is, that advice. That's one of the most interesting questions that I've received till now. Uh, I'm, I'm just taking some time to think about it because I just want to formulate this correct. But, uh, and it's probably not based on advice that I got. It's, I think it's, it's based on what you what I wanted to do. And I would just simply say, follow your dreams. That's, that's really about it. If you carry on doing what you're doing, you will do well. And then, I mean, there's no reason why you should doubt yourself and there's no reason why you won't do well. That's totally fascinating, sir. Let me let me let, let me put this in a slightly different perspective because you know I, I get this from a lot of young lawyers, uh, and it's the most common mistake that I believe most young lawyers make, especially if they want to do litigation. Uh, a lot of young lawyers want to do litigation in the traditional way of doing litigation in India, which is you know joining a small law office, that means setting up their own practice. Uh, always look around and look at other people and compare the opportunities they get with the opportunities that some other people get for whatever reason. And they're always mourning about it and they're always cribbing about it. And that's absolutely the wrong way to go about your career. So when I became an English barrister, and this was a couple of years ago, uh, I mean, obviously I was much older and I wasn't a very young lawyer then. Uh, I actually asked one of my clerks in London saying, how do you think my practice is compared to somebody else? And the person, the clerk looked at me and he said, that's the biggest mistake you'd ever make. Don't look at your practice and compare it with somebody else's. Look at your practice in year one, say where you want to take it in year two. And if you're happy with where you've taken it in year two, then great, you look at how you want to take it to year three. And that's how you've got to look at it. Uh, your practice is your practice. It depends on where you want to take it. You can't be looking around and saying, well, I don't. Uh, it's not as good as somebody else's practice. That's that's the biggest mistake you'll ever make. So while you're having a discussion, I think uh, there's one more question that we have. Uh, would the question of arbitrability of a dispute in case of an insolvency be governed by the law governing the arbitration agreement or the judicial law governing the arbitration? If you go by Vivendi, sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. Will the question of arbitrability of the district be governed by the law governing the arbitration agreement or the curial law? That's going to be a tough one to answer. Okay? Uh, because frankly, I've never, I've never had to deal with, 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 with a question like this in real life. So I haven't really thought about this, but I must tell you it's an extremely good question. Okay, let me be candid. I, I can't give you a straight up answer to this. Okay, and I'll tell you why I can't give you a straight up answer to this. Because if the insolvency happens at the seat of the arbitration, okay, naturally the next arbitrary will kick in, which is which is the law, which is the curial law. Okay. So let me let me put it this way. If you're looking at say a Singapore company getting into a dispute with a American company and the seat of arbitration is in Singapore and the Singapore company becomes insolvent even if both parties have chosen English law as the law governing the arbitration agreement naturally the seat being Singapore, the insolvency regime being Singapore there's very little reason to doubt that it would be in accordance with the Lex Arbitrary, the Curial Law but if I was to say you have an Indian company with a seat of arbitration in Singapore with an American counterparty and the governing law being English law and the insolvency regime of India kicks in and a company becomes bankrupt, then are you going to be looking at Singapore law to ascertain whether the insolvency regime kicks in or whether you look at English law, which is the law governing the arbitration agreement to see whether uh, 
the insolvency regime kicks in, well, I don't, I cannot give you a straight up answer. It is complicated. It requires a significant amount of research. And perhaps uh, as students, you could do that research and publish a paper on it. I don't think uh, in my experience, this question has been answered, which is why I think it's a great question. And it has put me in a spot. So thank you for putting me in a spot. Uh, it's always good when lawyers get difficult questions to answer because it's something that I will now have to think about. And thank you, sir. Uh, with this, I would just like call once more if anyone has any questions. Was that will be ending the session? There are a few questions in the chat box. Right. Uh, I think this will be the last question for today. Uh, with respect to Mobile Ops case again, the Supreme Court reiterated the pre existing dispute principle so that corporate debtor does not get away from CIRP through patently feeble argument. However, what would happen if a post insolvency dispute has been initiated by the operational creditor itself? Sorry, I, I, I missed that completely. I right, sir. Hear. I'll, I'll read it. With respect to Mobile Ox case, again, the Supreme Court reiterated the pre existing dispute principle so that corporate debtor. Losing you again. Right, sir. I, I can't hear you. All right, sir. So, one minute. With respect why to Mobile Ox. Email that question to me. Like All, right. All right, sir. We do that. I'll ask the participants to do that. Yeah, I mean, if somebody wants to just drop drop an email to me, just just drop an email to me. I mean, I could hear a little bit of mobile locks and a little bit of pre-existing dispute, but I couldn't pick it up after that. Right, sir. So, sir, I think with this, uh, thank you, sir, for such an enlightening knowledge. Uh, yeah, sir. I couldn't hear you properly. One minute, sir. I'll check my connection. Am I audible right now? You're a little better, but yeah, okay. Uh, so, sir, with this, thank you, sir, for this enlightening and a knowledgeable session for us at NLIU. Thank you, sir. audible. Okay, that, that, that's fine. I mean, it, it's been great uh, to have you guys uh, listen to this. I hope you've had a great time. I'm sure none of you are enjoying studying right now. I've got kids who go to school and I think online teaching, I mean, it's the best alternative you have. Uh, doesn't in any way make for uh, the real life experience of being in college where you not just attend classes, but hang out with friends and do a lot of stuff like that, uh, which I know as, as a parent, uh, kids come do. But I hope life gets back to normal and you guys can enjoy yourself and enjoy the rest of your uh, time at law school and like I said follow your dreams. <laughs>